Hi, everybody. Welcome to Discover College Soccer. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Coach Cummings from Missouri S&T. Welcome, Coach. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, we were we were just talking for a second. Coach and I actually met probably almost 20 years ago uh, when we were both coaching D2 in Indiana, working camps and stuff together. And and he's back on a on the D2 trail there at Missouri S and T. Uh, opening day tonight. So good luck, Coach. Um, but let's uh, let's talk about uh, you know Missouri S and T and and how you're you're getting your players in. You got a great great picture there behind you of your roster. So, you know, what at, at that school specifically, you know, when are you really starting to hear from players? When are you going out recruiting, watching players kind of making that list? What's that time frame look like for you? I think, you know, obviously every university is a little different time frame. You, you know, you hear some that, Hey, sophomore year, I mean, things are being made, but generally on the men's side, it doesn't really happen that way. But I would say because of our engineering and in our reputation, it happens a little bit earlier than I've had in other schools, you know, where a lot of times junior year, especially senior year, it's not abnormal to have, you know, a lot of recruiting going on there. But here, you know, I've had as early as going into freshman year, you know, um, you know, just trying to get on the radar because of our engineering and our reputation in that department, as well as um, other, you know, academic degrees that we have here. Yeah, no, it makes sense. What? When somebody reaches out and contacts you about, you know, potentially coming to school there and playing ball, what what are some of the things that you like to see in that first communication from a recruit? Well, I'd first like to see that they did it. They wrote the email, um, you know, because it is the player that ultimately I will be coaching and having in front of me and building a relationship with. So nothing wrong with, you know, having someone overlook it. I mean, I have my wife overlook my email sometimes, you know, in text because sometimes I just, you know, I, I get speaking faster than writing. But in terms of it has to be, as a coach, feel like this came from you. Uh, maybe that you know something about us rather than just kind of saying, you know, I've had emails where they said, hey, I've watched many of your games, you know, and it's like, okay, you didn't. And then I saw you send this to 50 other coaches. So, it, you know, I think it has to be personal, just like recruits want to feel like they're wanted. Coaches in the universe, they want to feel they're wanted as well. And so do a little bit of your homework that you understand what the school is, maybe even a little bit about the program and the position specifically that you're looking at, that maybe there's a senior in there that shows you did a little bit of homework. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, after you've kind of <clears throat> built up that list of, of recruits and, and maybe you're out on the trail, kind of what are some of the tournaments that, that are kind of must-see on your list? What are some of the leagues you like to, to, to watch and uh, where do you spend a majority of that time? Sure. It changes every year, right? I mean, I since I got here to the Midwest, so, you know, when I was in California, I really liked it because pretty much I didn't have to leave the state because soccer in high school, there's in the winter time. So you, you had the whole spring, summer, and fall, the Watchmen Club, you know, play and do all those kind of things. So I really, you know, enjoy that part. So I would say I try to find, you know, the tournaments that are local first. You know, obviously in St. Louis, they have, a, you know, they host many tournaments in Kansas City. You know, so I try to get on those. And then when I start to broaden my scope, I start to look at areas that I feel like we have an opportunity because – our funding isn't necessarily the best. I just can't go everywhere. So I try to find tournaments that make sense where we've had players come from that, that maybe have areas where there's not maybe as many, you know, schools in, the, in those areas that have great tournaments. Like, you know, Arizona has great tournaments. You know, Las Vegas, uh, you know, I'll see. You know, we get many players because of engineering because of Texas. So, I, I, you know, I look at those type of tournaments and then I pick from there. But I'm trying to really be specific so that it's really, you know, valued where we go. Makes sense. What about what about camps? Uh, you know, obviously we we met at a camp many moons ago, but but how do camps fit into your your recruiting uh, mix? So I think for us, you know, ours. I mean, I've always had a division two level, as you know, we have where we have the ability to try out. I mean, at our level, we the player could come and try out, train with the guys. Um, but our, we have our ID camps. We, you know, we're not doing overnight camps. We have a two day ID camp. And the reason why I made it two days was I feel like, you know, over the years, I've seen players that come in that one day and then they say, well, I wasn't feeling well or, hey, I was feeling nervous. And, you know, whatever reason, I fear over a course of two days, you're going to get more touches than I would see you probably in two tournaments worth of, of touches. And so I'll get a taste of that and your personality. Because hopefully I'll get a little bit of, of pulling, pulling back a little bit of the layers of who you are, 
and then also for you to get to know me as well as um, our players that, you know, worth the camp because it's only us that are running it because, you know, we're just interested in trying to find the right players for um, Missouri s &T. So your ID camp, every year we've had a player recruited from ID camp in many years, multiple players. In terms of whether it's a camp or, or tournaments or, or anything like that, when you're deciding, you know, okay, this is a player we want to pursue, kind of what does that hierarchy of factors look like, whether it's on the field attributes or off the field stuff? Uh, you know, I always, the first thing I looked for, and it's, it was that we were at a college talk and, you know, a player asked, what do coaches look for? And everybody went through their thing. And I actually said, I look for people like me because it has to start with personality. It has to start with, do you have characteristics that are similar to me? I don't need you to be like me as a player, nor do I want you to be like me as when I play, except for certain characteristics personality-wise, you know, with grid, you know, mindset, all those type of things. So I think, you know, just like in any relationship, I can't go into a relationship feeling like I gotta do all the changing to build this. But as a player, I am good with you being a 180 from, um, you know, maybe who I was, that's okay because we need diversity to have success. And so I feel like I find, I'm trying to find players that are making our team great, not just great players that come in and, and aren't the personality. So I kind of maybe do things a little different. I'm looking at characteristics. I'm looking at, you know, who they are as people. No, that, that makes perfect sense to me. You know, looking at your roster, there is a, a, a good mix of international players as well. So how does that international recruiting kind of fit into everything for you guys? Yeah, you know, I... I I think, you know, our, our internationals are a little bit different than maybe some of the, you know, because when people say, oh, internationals, because of our our degrees and they're coming here, you know, we don't, you know, we don't have the, the you know, the fully funded kids. I mean, there's a high criteria they have to meet. And so our internationals come in, not only are they good players, but they come in highly academic and focused and everything. And, you know, I've coached for, as said, you know, oh gosh, now 22 years and I love all my players, but, you know, in other places, maybe, the, you know, cricket wasn't quite as rigorous. So the internationals and what their entry and the type of player you got in. But so I think, you know, it's a good opportunity for us to learn from them and for them to learn from us. But I would even take a step further that I think our diversity goes so much beyond that because we have, because of our academics, we have players from Arizona, California, New York, North Carolina, Texas. So, you know, we sometimes, you know, when I say we're a diverse group, a lot of first seeing people tend to think, oh, internationally. Well, that's part of it, but that's not all of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I when when I was in college, I think we had fifteen states represented out of twenty players. So it was a, it, but that was fun. It was it yeah. really added to the to the feel. Um, well, let, let let's talk about the school a bit. You know, there's a lot of people I'm sure who aren't familiar with with Missouri S and T. So you know, we can go to the website and learn a lot of things. But but give me some some of the tidbits, the inside scoop of what makes that school awesome that I might not learn just by going to the website. Sure, I I, I would think the number one is just I, I said we're a major Division One academic university. I mean, we're Division Two athletics, but when you look at the numbers and and, and who we have produced, we've had astronauts that have come through these doors. Um, the vendor of twi uh, Twitter came through here, you know, a couple of years before going to NYU. Um, you know, we have had governors, we've had people work at Microsoft, Google. And I think for us in engineering, that is our niche. And I feel every school has their niche and we are the number one public university in engineering and number five overall. And so we are sitting at the table with MIT's Harvard Stanford's of the world in, in the engineering field. We're just a silent partner. And I don't think people quite realize that what we're about until they get entrenched in it. So for here, we're not selling degrees, nor do I talk about degrees. Here, we're about preparing you to make high earnings at what you choose to study and want to go on. And I think the evidence is on the salaries on the back end. Last year, I lost 10 guys that all could have came back this year because of COVID year, but all of them got jobs, you know, with really good salaries to start their life off. And so I think, you know, when you come here, it's a unique situation. I mean, you're not coming here to the party and, and look at this social, not that we don't have that, but it's really to look at the next 40 years. And, you know, so it's, it's a different place, you know, so. No. And with that being said, how does, uh, the the school, the athletic department, really support the the student athletes in balancing the rigors of that academic side of things with with playing sports. Sure, you know, obviously, when you look at you know funding, our funding maybe isn't quite the same as some of the other schools in in terms of things, but I think we we have a grasp of 
you know, who we are um, and who we're not. Um, but I don't focus in so much on who we're not because then that takes too much energy. I look at who we are and who we can be. Um, but our ethic department's the same way. You know, for instance, we, we go several mornings at 5.45 a.m. to 7.30, not because, hey, that's just what we want to do. It's because that's what we need to do for them because of the labs and the academic rigors and the studying that goes on. You know, the time has to be for them. So right now, they'll have a schedule of 5.45, 5.45 a.m. to 7.30 and then 7.45 to 8.45 for weights. And then the rest of the day is theirs, which is different than a lot of other schools. We go one day in the afternoon because also we play Sunday afternoons. We have to have a day that at least we mimic what it's like to be in the afternoon rather always training in the dark. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we do, we do, you know, we get a little understanding. You know, we, we try to, I always tell them, I value who they are and what they're doing at this school. And, and I can appreciate everything, but we just have to come to that common ground that we can get what we both need out of this. No, oh, that's that. Can, can you actually walk us through, you know, you kind of just gave us a snapshot, but can you walk us through what a typical week during the season looks like in terms of, okay, we were practicing in the morning. Is, what are normal class times that they're in, meals, travel, sure. game day situation? What, what does that, all that look like? Obviously, you guys uh, are opening up here. Uh, yeah. yeah. So typically now our conference has changed a little bit, so the landscape's changed. It used to be just last year where we'd have one kind of open weekend, and then we'd start conference, which was Friday, Sundays. So generally in a typical week, once we get into the meat of, of our conference, Friday, Sunday matches, and, and today – this week will be Friday, Sunday as well. We'll have Monday off, you know, the after Sunday, that'll be the recovery. They can choose, you know, it's their time, whatever they need to do, but it's mainly for school, maybe rehab, getting back in there. Tuesday, we go 5.45 a.m. to 7.30, and then they have weights after that till 8.45. And then the rest of the day is theirs, you know, to, to do classes. So they'll go from typically, you, you know, you, you'll have some going from 10 a.m., and they're done at three. Yep. I mean, so it, but it varies. But then we have some that have class till six, you know, but they have a big gap in between just because of the labs and the type of, um, you know, uh, courses they're taking. It fluctuates. I have some class, I have some students that have seven to 9 p.m. classes. So we kind of have to make that all happen here. Wednesday, we go out in the afternoon, four to, you know, around 530. You know, again, you know, we got to plan it. I've got a lot of players that are coming right at four because they get out at 350. <laughs> so we're actually not getting started to a little. And then I got a deal on the back end where we have some that have six o'clock class. So I have to make sure that they get in there. So we really have to streamline everything, you know, make sure we're very efficient at what we do. Thursday, we go back to the morning. It's a walkthrough, obviously, and then they have weights. And then Friday, we don't have anything because game day. And then we play tonight at seven. And then Saturday becomes a training recovery for Sunday, you know, starting to move forward and doing all those type of things. And then the days there for studying and do what they need to do. But yeah, you know, we have to plan. We have to work around their schedules at times. You know, some of them have jobs on campus like other campuses, but the main thing is we got to work around their academics. We're on the road. Many times I'll proctor an exam because unlike other schools here, when there's an exam, they're not able to, to postpone it. They have to take on the day. So I've got to find a time, a way to fit that in and, and get it done and then uh, fax over, email the, the test back. Just it's that type of school where they just want to make sure that there's no opportunity for anyone to have a academic advantage because they had an extra couple of days of studying. No, oh, wow. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the soccer side. You guys open up tonight, which has got to be exciting. Um, you know, I, like I said, we see the roster there behind you, but but do you have a typical roster size that you're trying to hit each season? Well, you know, it, it's it's interesting because at a school like here, you know, we're obviously majority males to females just because of the STEM, but we're growing that. We're growing that. But because of that makeup, this is a unique situation that, for instance, Title IX is reversed where we actually have to have a bigger roster because we have to match what the population percentage is of male to female. And so we actually have 41 that we have to carry, you know, in order for that. So it's a big roster and everybody's always asking me, how do you manage that? How do you do that? Well, very carefully, um, uh, you know, very diligent in terms of making sure it's not that much downtime that we've got a lot of things going, people active. And so, um, you know, there's the challenges, but, I think the guys, they do a good job because we keep talking about the journey, you know, and that's the key to understand that there's guys that obviously aren't going to travel because we travel roughly around 22 players. So that means about 18 players will not be traveling. 
But every year they have to realize that we have players that are now traveling that were on that side that did their time. They put in the work and then they found their way making the first team. And that could be in one year, two years, or three years. I mean, we have a young man that will be dressing that had never dressed until this year. And he's been here for three years, but he's put in the work and now it's his time. And, you know, like I said, that's what it, that's the challenge, I think, more than anything, to be honest, even more than the X's and O's in your opponent. It's just how do you maintain that mentality with that group to understand that everyone's valued and everybody's role is super important. It just may vary the role that you have on the team for year to year. Yeah, no, I can see that being tough. What do you have uh, additional staff? Uh, that help you manage that? What kind of other staff does the athletic department have that just kind of help, uh, you know, fill all the roles sure. within the, the team? Well, you're looking at them and everything. <laughs> so when I joke, I mean, it's, you know, that's part of, like I said, you know, the, some of the things we're trying to improve here. Um, our athletic director is working hard and, and the uppers are trying, we're, you know, we're getting there slowly, but there's still that academic thought of, hey, this is who we are and, and we have athletics and they support it, but they just, you know, we're getting there, we're getting there. So it is, you know, me and I always joke with other coaches when we're out sometimes and, you know, I'll say, hey, my, my assistant's just too lazy to be going anywhere. I mean, I got to come out here. I mean, but it is sometimes challenging when you go somewhere and you see assistant coaches and then the head coaches are somewhere else and so that's where when you talk about earlier the question about where do I go to recruit I really got to make sure I'm in an area that I have multiple target players that I'm looking at because I can't afford to send myself going somewhere for one player if I if I had a staff I could do that because I know there'll probably be more than just one there but I can't risk that when it's me I have to kind of go because I just can't waste any opportunity to recruit in numbers yeah no totally understandable um well you know again game day you know with if i grabbed a couple of your players and asked them you know how would you describe uh your style of coaching and, and the team style of play what are, what are they going to tell me well i'll say I, I think they'll say personality talks a lot i mean that i mean i'll be the first i mean yeah i, I can chatter um uh, but i also think they'll They'll say, I mean, I lead by example, because I think, you know, one thing I've learned in, in the recent years has just come to the surface is, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk. It's easy to write things, things like, oh, we ought to do this, the right words. I just always live my life by the substance, just live it and, and, and breathe it and act on it. And so I think they'll, they'll all say that I care. You know, I have passion for them. I have passion for winning. I have passion for what I do. Um, I have their best interests in mind. I understand just like in a regular family, not all will like my decisions every day. But then again, when you're a parent, you don't like every decision that they've made, but you respect it. And I think with this group, they're a very close group. And the example I use is, and I didn't even realize this towards the end of the spring, I was made aware that 17 guys, and at the, in the springtime, we only had 25 guys, I think at that time, because we brought in 18 new players this year. And so we had 25, 17 all went spring break together. And then the other, I think, six, seven went to South Carolina together. So the, basically the whole team went somewhere together. And that was kind of unique and, and, and just told me a little bit of how the relationship are with each other. And to me, that's right there. There's what you need to know because they don't have to. Spring break, you're generally doing whatever. But for them, they'll still want to be together. So, I mean, I would say, yeah, that would be anything. I have. Tactic-wise, I would say, you know, like anything, we want to keep the ball. But I also think in college, it, you know, I tell them, you got to be able to be direct and you got to possess the ball. I think the main thing is just take what's given to you. That's one thing I always try to stress to them. You know, if, if it's two touches, it's two touches. If you, if you can dribble, you can dribble. But again, don't do any more than what your opponent's allowing you to do. Just take what they give you. And if it, it means we can go direct, we'll go direct. But if we want to keep the ball, so ideally, of course, we would like to keep it. But at the same time, there's opportunities to go forward. It is about scoring and creating opportunities. And if you can do it in three passes instead of 25, I'm all for the three. <laughs> gotcha. Well, in terms of the off season, so I know we're, we're we either re rewind or fast forward, however you want, yeah. <laughs> want to do it. Yeah. You know what? What does the typical off season look like for you guys? Well, our off season will be once our season's over. Then we'll meet 
And then by survey rules, we have to have two weeks off, 14 days. But we generally just give them the rest of the semester because a lot of them are still trying to catch up with academics and maybe they're a little behind. They're getting ready for that last push um, for finals. Because, you know, one of the things that are is kind of a non-negotiable for us is to maintain as a team GPA 3.0. With 41 guys, that's tough. But at a school like here, we told them, you didn't come here for easy. So I think that's an attainable. So for us, you know, that's the thing that we leave them at is, hey, now we got to win this part. You know, this is part of our team goals. We talk about wins and all this. This is part of winning right here. So we give them the rest of the semester, we'll have individual meetings, you know, kind of tell them how the fall went, um, what we're looking for in the spring, those who didn't play, you know, kind of what we, um, you know, I guess what I saw in their progress, you know, through the fall. You know, I always tell people, when you're not playing, you tell me a lot of who you are based on your reaction to the decision do you train hard and keep getting better you know if you wait to the spring as you know as, you know as former coach there it's tough to um to also win a position when you didn't put in the work you got to put in the work in the fall if you're not traveling um so spring comes i would usually give them three weeks off at the beginning they get acclimated a to the weights again because they'll be sore we'll do the weight training we'll get classes and then we'll meet and then we'll start doing our one hour or eight hours, you know, on the ball or four hours, sorry, on the ball that we can get on. And so it's not very taxing. And then we get into a traditional spring season like everyone else. We'll have five dates. We try to play, you know, six or seven games, you know, but because of COVID, you know, things have been living it the last several years. But um, and then we end it with usually an alumni game, an event, and then we go off, you know, and then, you know, May's here. And then they're off to their, I said, my guys are unique. They're off the internships, most of them. Where everybody else is looking to go play, my guys are on the oil fields or or working in Mercedes factory. I don't know, but they're all generally working in internships, you know, which yeah. makes preseason unique. Yeah. You know, I say that is how I address it. You know, a lot of people don't know how I address preseason is different than most, where I, I have to realize what reality is and who what they're not going to be coming in based on what they're doing all summer with their work. Sure. And so uh, my preseason looks a little different than some of the others. Yeah, well, that makes perfect sense. Well, Coach, we've, we've covered a lot of ground uh, and talked about a lot of different things. So I always like to end these with the last question of what didn't we cover? What else do you want people to know, whether it's about the school, the team, the recruiting process, college in general, you name it, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, <laughs> that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, I, I'll start with the general Athletes, you know, looking to go to play at college, you got to be proactive. You have to be proactive. I think too many young young players and even parents, they, they expect because they're paying money with club coaches and all this that, hey, you're going to see me. I mean, they've got to use their resources. I don't think enough use their club coaches or, or many of them have college recruit, you know, I mean, recruiters that can help them, the system and all that type of things. And then I would say, you know, Broaden your scope. Don't just look at one thing. You know, look at all divisions. Take a look at the schools, you know, all those type of things. But above all, get the grades because grades give you options, whether it's a school like us or anywhere. It doesn't make a difference. If you have grades, you have options. Don't let your grades be the reason why you can't get somewhere that wants you and you want to be there, but because of grades. And for us, I think, you know, what we have the opportunity is you're coming to a premier university, academic university that's going to prepare you to succeed. You know, um, three years ago, we had an alumni donate $300 million to our academics, would put us among just a few that have ever had that amount. So we, I was challenged my player, who's going to be the next one to donate that? Now, maybe Porsche could come to soccer. That'd be nice, come in <laughs> soccer. But the point is, that's what you're here for. You're here to get that degree. Ultimately, as we know in athletics, it ends at one point. And so, but this degree won't. And then our conference. Our conference is one of the premier division two conferences in the nation. Um, now we keep losing teams in division one. You know, we just lost two teams with Lindenwood and Southern Indiana. And then uh, the, two years ago, uh, Bellarmine. And there's rumors of another school after this year. So it's kind of like, you know, I'd say, boy, it's a struggle because then we got to find more in our conference games, but it's kind of testament to our conference. I mean, you yeah. know, we're in this area. Northern Kentucky was part of this. I mean, yep. there's so many schools that are D1 now that were all part of this conference. So that's another thing. You're going to be challenged as a player because all these coaches are great in the conference and it's different brands. That's what I love about it. It's not the same, oh, this team is this. You're going to have teams of mainly all kids that are domestic players, American kids. Other ones are mainly all internationals and then ones that are, the hybrid between the two. So that kind of makes it exciting. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And great advice uh, to the recruits. And it's it will be interesting to see how the landscape uh, continues to change in the D2, D1 environment. But Coach, we wish you the best of luck tonight, opening night. Good luck in the, in the conference. It is one of those one of the most toughest ones out there for sure. So hopefully you guys can can stand atop the podium this year and we wish you the best. We wish you the best <laughs> yeah, of luck. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you.